Welcome back to On the Ground with Samaritan's Purse, where we take you to the front lines and behind the scenes of our work around the world. This year has brought so much heartache, pain, and suffering around the world. And Samaritan's Purse continues to run into the pain and the fire to offer hope and healing in Jesus' name. Uh, Samaritan's Purse has been sharing the gospel both in word and deed all over the world. And this week, uh, at our international headquarters, we read from Matthew 24. And as we got updates from Ukraine, it was hard not to think about the text in Matthew 24, 4 through 8. Jesus replied to them, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. You are going to hear of wars and rumor of wars. See that you will not be alarmed, because these things must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and the kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these events are the beginning of labor pains. Samaritan's Purse has been serving in these labor pains all over the world. Romans 8, 22 says something similar. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as the pains of childbirth right up until present time. Here on earth, we have groanings. Uh, This is a fallen, broken world, and we are called as Christians to bring the hope of Jesus. In Samaritan's Purse, we will continue to be faithful in serving and sharing the name of the gospel until the end. As it says in Matthew 24, 14, the good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so today we want to give updates and just ways that Samaritan's Purse has been working as we're halfway through the year 2022. God has been gracious. He has allowed us to serve in so many countries and contexts. And so I sat down with Edward Graham, my husband, as he has um, traveled um, to many of these projects and seen them firsthand. And so we just wanted to give some updates and what he's seen throughout the ministry and how God's been faithful. It's hard to believe that we're halfway through the year, you know, here that now that we hit July, six months of ministry, we just wanted to kind of look back and see what God's done. And I know we still have half the year to go, uh, but we're expecting of what He's going to do, but we just wanted to look back. And so we wanted to bring you in today and just talk about some high-level ministry updates. Uh, But I thought we'd start with Ukraine, since you've been there most recent and you saw it from the beginning of the war, and you've watched the way that even Samaritan's Purse has changed in their response. So can you maybe even give us an update? What are we doing in Ukraine, and what did it look like? You were just there a few weeks ago. What what did it look like? Yeah. Well, war changes and Mm -hmm. war evolves. And I saw that, you know, the first, I was there the second week of the war, and that's when you saw this mass exodus of people leaving the country. That was um, millions of people. The the borderline was 14 kilometers long, and just in the car line, we timed it, and the human line was uh, three kilometers long. It took days to get to the border. That is no longer the case. You know, the, Russia didn't make the advances like they thought they would, or the world even thought they would. And at that time, we'd set up a hospital, emergency field hospital. When I went over on the DC-8, we took the field hospital to Lviv, and we set it up there, and we set down a step-down clinic at the train station where all the refugees were coming off the trains. Um, that started to slow down, which is good. Um, and the patients started to slow down coming to the hospital, which is good, but there's still a great need further to the east, to the north, and to the south. And that's where we have pushed further of our, our medical operations. Um, we realized there was a lot of people that weren't surviving blast injuries that might normally survive if people were trained correctly. So we set up a training program that we're bringing in a specialist. I met one of our team members on the disaster assistant response team um, from Vanderbilt, and she was over there training these medical workers how to treat and triage blast patients. And then we set up an ambulance program that transports those blast victims from the point of injury um, once they come off the battlefield and they go to the casualty collection point, and then we'll take them to other hospitals in Kiev or even further to Poland. Um, But then we still have medical clinic and operations uh, happening um, along the front, right outside the front, not not within um, artillery range. But that being said, war transitions. And when I was there that first time, I knew feeding was going to be a huge issue. And was, I had a meeting with the two different meetings with the head of the uh, Pentecostal Union and the Baptist Union. These are these represent thousands of churches. They were already feeding, housing, and transporting at that time these refugees that were coming through. But I knew once that slowed down, that 
logistics nodes they had would be perfect for feeding. You just reverse flow it. And that's what we set up. And Kenny Isaacs and their team have been feeding for weeks now. And we're talking metric tons of food getting to the front line. And we're able to track it. We're seeing the food going to Russian-controlled Ukraine. Um, and so the food's getting to where, it, where it's needed. There's a, you know, Ukraine feeds uh, large portions of the world. Uh, they're, they're grain, but they're stuck in silos, and it has to be processed. So that grain necessarily can't feed. Even if you take it out of silos, it's not processed. It can't feed um, Ukrainians. That has to be exported and then re-imported. That's the way it works. Um, so the, the feeding, though, is all done to the church. And that's what I love about it. This massive church network that some of it was built up by Operation Christmas Child, 3,200 churches there that do Operation Christmas Child. That's over 680,000 shoeboxes last year. Um, those churches have been involved a large portion of the feeding program, and they've been brave and bold. Uh, I couldn't be more proud of the church and what I've seen in Ukraine right now. So a lot of what is transitioned to answer your question, where it was largely medical, mm-hmm. um, it's still a huge bit of medical, and we're still, our DC-8 flies every five days, it's flying medical supplies over, so it's still a huge thing. But the feeding program is enormous. And the World Food Program just got there a few weeks ago and is partnered with our you know, with us because of our church partners, but it's the church that allows us to respond so quickly and so effectively. Mm-hmm. And even before we hit record, you know, we talked about Proverbs 69, you know, in his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And that's what I love about Samaritan's Purse. I love the way that every volunteer, every staff member I mean, everything we do is bathed in prayer Mm -hmm. and reliance on the Lord. And God, what do you want us to do? Because like you said, you know, we went in with maybe a plan. Here's what we're going to do. But God has written the response over the months. Uh, But what have you witnessed, I guess, and you've been back multiple times. How have you been witnessed? Because you've been to these churches. You've Uh sat with the pastors. You've watched the way that they've responded. And I I know your dad said it's both been convicting and challenging. Uh How, yeah, how have you been renewed in your faith by, by watching them in action? Well, we've, we've seen stories where ter- pastors gave their lives trying to get refugees out. Um, mm-hmm. That real famous bridge right outside of, of um, Irpin, uh, Ukraine, which is right near outside. It's a suburb of Kiev. Um, but here's a pastor that's bringing people across that little footbridge that was killed um, by a, a rocket blast that came in. And there's more examples like that. We, we, we've got videos, um, handheld videos and, and, and uh, photographs of these churches, these pastors delivering food at the front lines and being shot at by artillery, Russian artillery and rockets. So they're, they're living without fear. And I say that every once in a In combat, you're going to have a little bit of fear. Um, I did, even in my years of combat. And to say so there's no fear, that, that's not true. But to go knowing that we're already dead. Um, but these pastors, I think, live that knowing their life has already been planned out. It has a course. They just have to be faithful. And we're alive through Christ. And they're alive right now. They're living, and they're living boldly, and they're on fire. And I think after this, Ukraine, which is one of the most church countries in all of Europe, at the end of this war, at the end of this conflict, Ukraine was seeing the church they're the ones that were there. They're the ones that fed. They're the ones that transported. They're the ones that housed. They opened their doors when everyone else closed their doors. They loved their neighbor unconditionally. And as an American looking here, I couldn't be more proud of the church, but also a little bit more ashamed and embarrassed, especially about what I see in our church here sometimes and the decisions that come out of our churches and what we maybe take for granted, but also what we are so trivial over. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I know as you're talking, I thought of, you know, Paul's verse in Philippians, you know, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Because you're right, as Christians, to live as Christ, we are to be his servant with every day that we're given. But ultimately, to die is to gain. Mm -hmm. And we are to live in order to tell people about that hope. And so that's what we're seeing lived out. Um, And yeah, one pastor, I think, said in his flesh, he wants to leave. You know, he wants to leave with his family. But as a Christian, he knows he's called to something different. Yeah. And so we're watching that. And so I think Samaritan's Purse, obviously, we do what we do because of the Lord and yeah. His favor, but it's through the local church. But another huge piece is aviation. And yeah. you mentioned, you know, flights are going every couple days to bring medical supplies, resupply them, yeah. food. But there was also an awesome component that came in in that we were able to bring out refugees. Yeah. And you were just in Greensboro uh, to watch the plane go to bring back refugees. Talk to me about 
how that came to be. And, and again, God just brought projects that we never envisioned happening. Yeah. And, well, you know, Samaritan's Purse from when I was a kid to where I came back out of the military has grown quite a bit. You know, I can remember Samaritan's Purse of about six employees. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of capacity, and our aircraft is one of the greatest things that God's given us and trusted to us that allows us to respond so quickly. We would not be able to do this response in Ukraine um, the way we're doing it and to the scale we're doing it without it, but also the speed. The church network and that aircraft has kept us going. But you know, you look at um, the church network. We have the international affiliate offices. So we have offices in Canada, um, the UK, Germany. Australia and South Korea, and they all want to help their donors, their churches all want to support. And then Kenny Isaacs with our projects department is focused internally to Ukraine, the church is there, and I'd, I wanted us to set up joint operations well. I don't want us stepping over church partners because there's so many churches, and these affiliate offices have their own church partners through Operation Christmas Child that they have historical relationships with especially outside of Ukraine. Think of all, where all these Ukrainians got outside, Moldova, Romania, Poland. The, the German office, especially the German and the UK office, have historical relationships to Operation Christmas Child. So they partnered with these churches financially, supporting them. This one church in Poland has been unbelievable. I mean, they, were, they bought a hotel um, to house Ukrainian refugees. And the hospitality in Poland has been unbelievable, especially with the church, loving their neighbor, giving them a place to stay. But the, one of these churches that we partnered with was housing um, these refugees, and then we also were able to uh, coordinate a deal and with understanding that Canada would accept refugees uh, into Canada. And so we've the last few flights of our DC-8, and the DC-8 holds about 40 people. Um, it's a, mainly a cargo plane, but it has some passenger seats in the back we usually use for our disaster assistant response team for the DART. But we were taking refugees back, so the plane wouldn't come back empty. We were landing in Toronto and dropping off these refugees. So we're emptying this church. I don't call it a camp. It, they're living very well, very well taken care of, uh, living in dormitory-style uh, apartments. And um, and the church has been leveling on the last few weeks, but now we're getting them to family. These are Ukrainians that have family or somewhere already to go in Canada, and this is something that the government of Canada helped set up. We we're just facilitating um, one of our church partners giving these uh, refugees a ride to Canada. Transport. Mm -hmm. I know. I love it. Um, so let's transition domestically. Let's talk about U.S. disaster relief because so much has happened in yeah. six months. I think what? 11 different responses. Um, can you talk to me about what, we've, what you've watched and witnessed? I know you've been to many of these sites. Yeah. Well, you know, it's been a busy year, and we don't go, Samaritan's Purse, when we go somewhere, we don't leave until the job's complete. Mm -hmm. Just like in Ukraine, we're not going to leave anytime soon. We're actually transitioning to a country office, so we'll be there for years. Mm -hmm. um, so money and resources that come in, it takes time to commit those to long-term projects, um, so I think, you know, back in December 10th, I believe it was, is when the tornado hit up in Mayfield, Kentucky. And I went there just about two days after mm -hmm. the tornado. That entire city was destroyed, completely devastated. Almost every building, every government building, every home, downtown wiped out by an F4. Um, some reports it was an F5. But this... Um, this tornado was unbelievable power, what it did in, in destruction of this community. And we responded. I went out Christmas Day with our volunteers. We worked for for weeks for just immediate response. But then we transitioned to the rebuild. And so this takes time, um, but we want to work quickly. We were able to buy some land, coordinate with the, the county planners. Uh, that land has just been cleared, and we'll put about 60 new homes, brand new homes, and these for people that are underinsured or not insured that lost their home in the tornado, and we'll get them back into their homes. And then there's other homes, too, that we will work that were maybe had the roofs ripped off. Um, we put new roofs on. Um, we'll... Uh, Storm shelters. Um, we'll put people that want to underground tornado shelters to get away these fiberglass tornado systems that are buried underground. We do that too in all the new homes that we're building. And people that may be handicapped and can't get underground, we actually have a design where we put a storm shelter built into the house. Uh, and this is something that we've designed through Lowe's Hardware a long time ago and have a deal with them, um, a relationship from a long time ago. One of the architects designed it. Um, but we're in Mayfield. This project will go on through the next year or two. 
putting people in their new homes, getting them out of temporary housing, uh, government housing, and put them back into new homes. So it takes time. Mm -hmm. So that's why some people, when they give and donate to Samaritan's Purse and they want to know where their money goes, we don't leave until the job's done. And we're still there serving that community, even though that happened back in 10 December. Um, We had our first job, immediate response, Mm -hmm. um, cleanup, and now let's get people back in their homes. But again, all through the church, Mm -hmm. the local church. We're living at the same church we partnered with. That church has been an unbelievable blessing to us in the community. And when these people go out and um, our assessors go out, and people uh, get back into new homes. Our chaplains, their Billy Graham Rapid Response chaplains, are still going out, loving on these homeowners, praying with them, getting back in. The church is following up with them and, and making sure those that made decisions for Christ are being discipled. Um, but then we've had fires out in New Mexico. Um, we've had flooding. Um, we've had some high wind damage. So there's been several cities uh, that we responded to. Um, but the, the volunteer response still has been unbelievable. Even though we're coming out of COVID, um, we've had thousands of volunteers that have supported Samaritan's Purse mm-hmm. and our disaster relief or North American Ministries uh, and committed to going out to these communities. Like I said, on Christmas Day, I was out. There was a couple hundred volunteers in Mayfield, Kentucky with me going out and serving the best volunteers that gave up their Christmas Day, their time with their families, or they brought their families with them mm-hmm. to serve. It was a beautiful thing to watch. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you brought up the local church again, like we talked about in Ukraine. Like you said, we don't we don't leave till the job's done. So some of these some of these sites. Well, at have one cl- point we will leave, but we will, and so the that's why we remains. want the local church because right. they live there. The church, that's and, and they're local. So, yeah. like you said, we bring in volunteers, we bring in staff from all over the country. But it's great to tap into the locals, the yeah. ones that actually know. Uh, you know, they've watched the hardware store be built, and they so they are more invested, yeah. I guess. Well. And again, for us, like in the, in the Ukraine, it is a church country. Not every country we go to mm-hmm. has a church or a large church network, but a lot do. And because of Operation Christmas Child, which is in about 120 countries mm-hmm. um, that we partner with with Operation Christmas Child, a lot of times when we do respond, it's, be, it's that network that we rely on, the Operation Christmas Child network, that gets us started. It's a great platform. God, we didn't intend it for that, an Operation Christmas Child to be used in that role. But God has a plan for the church and the church network. Um, but we'll go there and we'll respond. And then at some point, we do leave. We also, you know, in projects, in our international projects department, we're in about 20 countries with country offices. And sometimes, like Ukraine, we'll start a country office or a temporary one until the job's mm-hmm. done. But we want that church lifted up, supported, allow them to do what God's called them to do, to love their neighbors in a time of crisis. And when Samaritan's Purse does leave, it's the church that that country, that those people that were hurting and suffering, it was the church they saw a lot of. Not, it's not Samaritan's Purse, but the church. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now that you bring up Operation Christmas Trial, let's talk about that. Let's yeah. get some updates there because, you know, some people think it's just during collection week and that's it. It's one time a year, but yeah. it is a year-round operation. They are busy. I want to talk about the greatest journey. So can you talk to me about just what you're seeing Operation Christmas Child do and— yeah, I went out last year every, to every ministry center we have here in the U.S. Mm-hmm. So that's um, we we rent a space in Baltimore. Uh, we have a place in Chicago. Um, we own a place in Denver. We also own a place in California, and also own one in uh, Dallas, Texas, in Capel, Texas, right outside. And then we also rent a, a processing center down in Atlanta. I went to all those locations. About nine thousand year-round volunteers that make that. Uh, possible, not just the processing centers, but packing, uh, picking them up, taking the church, you know, picking up from the churches, and then take them to these processing centers to get uh, um, processed checks so we can ship overseas. Around the world, to all the affiliate offices that do shoe boxes, we collected almost just shy of 11 million shoe boxes last year, and that's coming out of a pandemic. Unbelievable, largest year ever. So the energy of the church is there, and this is all about evangelism. It's not about giving a kid a gift of toys. That's nice, and it's fun. I love watching the kids jump up and down excited, but the gift is the gospel. Every presentation comes clearly with a gospel presentation. So many of those kids, especially in unreached people groups or in unchurched areas, are getting to hear the gospel for the first time in their lives. But my favorite part of the entire program, even over the volunteers, and God does give us the best volunteers, I love um, The Greatest Journey. The Greatest Journey is a 12-week discipleship program for those kids that have gotten a shoebox, 
either made a decision for Christ or they sign up and want to go to about 4 million each year um, do the greatest journey. And this discipleship program is teaching kids to help boldly go out and share Christ with others, and it's working. Um, millions have come to Christ because of this program. Um, I think they're tracking since it started back in, in 2009, it's something like 15 million children have come to Christ because of the greatest journey. That's unbelievable, um, especially with the youth. But what I've seen where it works is where a kid's not afraid, they're not ashamed, um, where an adult may be, they don't want to share it with their neighbors. The kids, when they get something, they're excited about it, and they want to give it to someone else, and they want to share it with their families. And it's one of my favorite things about Samaritan's Purse and what we're a part of is Operation Christmas Child and the Greatest Journey. I'm glad you shared that story. And I know for, for you and I, we both got to go to Ecuador one year. And what stuck out to me the same was the Greatest Journey graduation when they honored the kids. But there were about 20 parents that yeah. took the course and graduated as well. Yeah. So you're right. We all think of the shoebox impacting the child, but yeah. it impacts the parents, the grandparents. I mean, the ripple effect is so great. But it started, you remember, Ecuador is like the first country we did the greatest journey in. Mm -hmm. And we watched pastors who were in their 20s mm -hmm. um, running these, right. these the greatest journey and running these programs. But they were recipients of a shoebox and participants mm -hmm. of the greatest journey about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so now you see they made a decision for Christ, and now they're pastors of churches. They're, they're planting church. These pastors that we met down in Ecuador, if you remember, some of them had built a building, just a structure right. in, a, in an unreached area, knowing that when they did a shoebox distribution there, that there would be a church would be planted. And so dad always goes, well, son, we don't, you know, we're not the church at Samaritan's Purse, and we don't plant churches. And he's right. We're not the church at Samaritan's mm -hmm. Purse, and our goal necessarily, we're not a church planting organization. But God used an Operation Christmas Child as a tool for those pastors that are bold, pastors that are committed to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, no matter what, no matter what cost, they're the ones that are going out and planting churches mm -hmm. and just using it as an instrument. So, mm -hmm. you know, Dad says we don't do it, but God's uh, taking it that direction and making things mm -hmm. happen. Well, we bo help bolster, but yeah. you're right. It's their faith. And, you know, I think they're projecting this year as they collect, it'll be probably the 200 million mm -hmm. box. So you think... Possibly, you know, Lord willing, we will collect, you know, over 200 million shoeboxes since the start of the ministry. And so you think 200 million, but that really is hopefully doubled, tripled, quadrupled when you think of the impact. Yeah. It's one of these things, Operation Christmas Child is one of those things in ministry that we'll never know on this side mm -hmm. of heaven. I think it's one of those things that, you know, I always love when people come up and tell me stories about when they first heard my grandfather. I call him Daddy Bill, um, but when they first heard Billy Graham. And or how their mother came to faith and she led their father and you know all the kids came to faith because their mother went to a Billy Graham crusade. I love the stories. Just think how many stories in heaven mm -hmm. we'll know about by then mm -hmm. and hear about where kids came to Christ. Um, but God, I think because we were faithful and made it about the gospel, not about toys. Mm -hmm. When Dad said it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ, it took off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that story. Um, so let's talk about one more project, uh, Children's Heart Project. Yeah. You know, this is a, another ongoing year, you yeah. know, and it's, I think, COVID kind of had a, a damper, but now it's been, there's been a lot of kids coming from Mongolia, yeah. Bolivia, uh, Africa. So talk to me about what you're seeing and how the fruit has been there. Yeah, it, we were able to start bringing more out. Um, I th we have an unbelievable story in South America coming out that was just shared with us where a mother had brought her child in and had a hole in her heart. And the mother claimed that she had the same hole, but it had disappeared. And this was a 16-year-old girl uh, who's the mother and that brought the little baby in. So this is a, a young girl herself. And she brings this child in, and well, let's just do a check on you too for the mother. They realized she had a massive hole still in her heart. So this would be the first time that we've done an operation on both a mother and a child. Now this, again, is a 16-year-old mother and her child will both receive life-saving surgery. But when we bring these these families here, or the caregiver, the mother, the aunt, whoever is coming with the child, they stay with a sponsor family. And then we have these hospitals, these partner hospitals around the U.S., but also in the Grand Caymans, a hospital down there partners with us as well. And they stay with a host family that's going to love on them, but love them in the name of Jesus. And we're seeing unbelievable decisions for Christ. Um, I can think countless women 
in Mongolia that know Christ um, and are going back and sharing Christ in these remote villages out in the middle of the steppes in Mongolia. And we had another story share where one of them, uh, there is Islam in Mongolia, and one of these was a... Uh, an Islamic herdsman, uh, the wife of an Islamic herdsman, she called her husband so excited about sharing Christ and shared Christ with him over the phone. And he goes, I know you believe, and I'm excited about talking to you about this when you get home um, because the church loved his child so much that the church wanted to give healing surgery. You know, dad always says medicine is a magnet for the gospel, and he's absolutely right. Um, we are gifted with unbelievable doctors and nurses with the knowledge of life-saving technology and procedures that take, is usually taken for granted here in the West, but is unbelievable life-saving. Um, and so to be able to bring these families in and share the gospel, um, I could go on all, all, you know, all day long about the Children's Heart Project. And is it is a huge ministry? No. you know, But we're seeing so many come to Christ in remote areas. So... Um, be praying for these children mm -hmm. and pray for the doctors. Um, pray for their skills, the nurses, but also pray for these host family, mm -hmm. the opportunity they had to be bold and loving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is one I encourage people to go on the website, look at where the partner hospitals are, because to be a host family, it's such a gift. You get to be a missionary in your own backyard. Yeah. But I think, yeah, so often here in the United States, you know, we take for granted the medical care that we're, we are offered. You know, our children would have this this surgery taken care of as days old. But mm -hmm. like you said, many wait years. But I can't imagine as a parent to watch your kids suffer. Kids are showing, they're blue mm -hmm. when they show up. Their skin color is blue, and you're like, there's no way that child could, how are they still alive? Mm -hmm. In many cases, when they, by, by the time they get here, um, mm -hmm. that's how critical the surgery is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for giving us updates on the last six months. I guess finally to close, how can we be praying? How are you praying for the yeah. next six months of ministry and what he has in store? Well, I think many in the world, especially people not inside the church, but people even in the church, because we're a society that lives in the now and the news with social media and TV, 24-hour news cycle, people move on. Mm -hmm. Um, you think about the families that even the tornado in Mayfield, Kentucky, it was news because it happened right at Christmas. Mm -hmm. Everybody was there, but the news has left, and the world's moved on. You look at Ukraine, how much interest it brought, and it's kind of starting to, to tail off, and people move on. Samaritan's Purse hasn't moved on from those locations. Why? The need is still there. The people hurting, we said, we'll be there until the job is done. Just like the story of the Good Samaritan, he met the immediate needs, but he just didn't leave that person. He also gave the innkeeper additional money and said, I'll be back to cover my debts as this doesn't cover it. So that's the model we're given. Mm -hmm. So pray. Pray for our team, for encouragement, especially for those that have been working in Ukraine and up in Kentucky. It is heartbreaking. We see the stories and you hear the stories and you know these people are hurting and they need they need life-saving medicine right now, or they need a place over their head, um, and we want to give that to them, but we want to show them the love of Christ and with great quality. So pray that our teams will stay encouraged, will stay focused for the long term, mm -hmm. and uh, that God will bless the efforts of the churches in Ukraine that are working so hard, the churches in Kentucky, the, the churches in New Mexico, um, Indiana, uh, with, with the flooding there. Just pray for... Pray for these churches and these family members that have gone through so much uh, that they'll stay committed to sharing the love of Jesus Christ. There are so many updates and stories to tell, and we couldn't cover all of the work in just one episode. But we wanted to cover a few of the highlights, and I hope this encourages you to learn more. You can uh, hear more on SamaritansPurse.org. There are so many web stories and videos, and SPTV.org also has endless videos that share the work that Samaritan's Purse is doing around the world. And in the future on the podcast, we'll be bringing more stories from some of these projects. We will dive deeper, and I'm excited for you to hear from church partners in Ukraine hear more details on our feeding program. We also uh, have a podcast correspondent in Mayfield, Kentucky, learning more about the Rebuild program, and we're going to introduce you to a homeowner who will receive keys to a brand new home. But thank you for your prayers and your support to the ministry. Uh, you help us uh, take the good news of Jesus uh, to the ends of the earth. I want to finish by reading Romans 8. I know I read uh, verse 22 about the labor pains, but I, I just want to finish reading 31 through 39 
uh, to remind you that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And this is why we go to share the hope of Jesus in hard times. Verse 31 says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will we not also, along with him, graciously give up all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors for him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nor present nor future or any powers, neither height nor death nor anything else in all creation will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And this is what we're seeing all around the world. Our church partners in Ukraine, uh, communities, pastors that have been devastated by tornadoes, they are clinging to the fact that nothing, height nor death, will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so that is the hope that we are giving to people in their suffering and in their pain. Thank you for tuning in today. I pray that this encourages you and challenges you to live in triumph today. God bless you. 